Ticket Volume is proud to bring you a VP of Customer Success at QStack with a long tenure of customer success at companies like Field Pulse, Verizon, Rainforest, and Bizarre Voice. Welcome to Ticket Volume, news and information for improving IT experiences. I'm your host, Matt Barron, and this podcast is powered by Invigate, a global leader in IT service software. As you know, every week I chat with different IT thought leaders from the industry to share insights on different aspects of service management, technology, and business. This episode is no exception. But before we start, don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. Now, let's begin. Welcome to Ticket Volume, Maddie Blumenthal. Hey, Matt. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure to have you. We had a great introduction at Support World Live. Um, ben Brennan and Amy introduced us, and it was great, actually, to see your session, too. You had a great session there. I did. It was really, really fun. And then we got to do that panel together uh, sort of at the end <laughs> to wrap it all up on that uh, experience dating game with, with our good buddy, Nate. <laughs> I forgot. I totally forgot about that. Apparently, I blocked that from my memory. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. And I love Nate. He has such a creative uh, a creative brain to talk yes. about CX initiatives. Well, it's nice because he, you know, when it comes to experience, right, like he, he is the full stop, the full show, right? I mean, he <laughs> shows up in that suit with the hat and the whole, you are, he is a face you will not forget. And, You're uh, part of the experience, yeah, right? Yeah, and oh. no different. <laughs> and that's a good reminder. I got to get him on the podcast. So thank you. you. Definitely should. I've been trying to get him on the HDI live stream too. So <laughs> he's yes. a hot commodity. He moves around quite a bit. You got to get him to sit still though. That's yes. That's the hard part. So, so you work at QStack, um, which is quickly becoming really popular among service providers and support providers uh, as a good measure for support transactions. What is QStack and why is it becoming so popular? Awesome question. So QStack measures the experience, but doesn't necessarily measure experience from, you know, how do we feel like we're doing? It measures how that experience is landing. What is the perception of that experience? on the other side of the keyboard. So we break down experience into five key dimensions. And to me, this is kind of the five key dimensions of any experience you go through. Kind of these are all the inputs that we're sort of analyzing as we go, as we interact with other humans. And those those five dimensions are quality, speed, technical knowledge, approachability, and communication. And so again, the sort of the, the differentiator between what QStack measures is it's not how we feel the experience is going, it's how does you feel the experience went. And so that's our main focus and how we're really helping IT teams form a strategy around their customer who are the employees. Okay. And so that do you think that's why it's becoming popular? Because it, it is outside in specifically? 100%. I mean, I okay. think there are so many inputs out there and, I, and IT has done a great job of sort of gathering information, right? There are SLAs, there's first call resolution. There's so much data that lives within IT. But when you're interacting with humans and you're supporting the employee or their, your customer, right? Mm -hmm. Similar to customer success, there is always a human, like, just because you think the data t paints a picture until I ask, like, hey, the data is saying this, does that line up to how you're feeling? You really don't know for sure. And so um, that's really why the sort of why I joined QStack because the parallels between how customer success came to be and that shift that's happening in IT right now, especially post COVID, um, it's just, it's really interesting, you know, how those parallels are, are so closely aligned. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I'm a metric hater. I totally, I hate all <laughs> metrics. Um, and I think, you know, you kind of, every time you're gathering information and putting it on a scale, you kind of got to be tongue in cheek with it. Like, yeah. listen, th this isn't a hundred percent accuracy. If we wanted true accuracy, we would literally be reading our customer's diary and there's no way you yeah. can actually grok that kind of data. Exactly. So what do you tell people when they say things like um, quality is subjective, um, speed is subjective? How do you approach that conversation with your customers? That's the point. And that's what's mm -hmm. really beautiful about it, right? Is that each human that you're interacting with is going to interpret what quality means to them differently, what speed mm -hmm. means to them differently. And so by asking them, hey, what does quality mean to you? And how are we mm -hmm. delivering on that? Then you're able to take each of these individual inputs and you'll notice all the themes that start to uncover and you'll learn a bunch of information that you didn't know. 
And that is far more interesting than what you already know, right? Because you know what you know. So I'm going to ask a very specific question. Is QStack, um, is it, is it, uh, is it, do you look at it on a per person basis or do you look at it, uh, all together as one, like, summary? Like, all of your quality ratings add up to this and your average is 7.2. So we look at it as the total average, right? So we'll, we'll measure each of the five dimensions, you'll get a dimension score, and then you'll also get the overall score based sort of your overall QStack number. But you'll have access to all that data. So you can then say, you know what, quality seems to be a problem. We got a really low quality score. Mm -hmm. And you can drill down in and say, okay, now I can read all the individual feedback as to why quality is, you know, why we got that score. Okay. And while we keep, you know, for me, this is sort of our... um, thoughts on surveys that they should be anonymous because that's where you're going to get the most honest truth is if you can't trace it back to me giving you negative feedback. Um, you know, you can still, we, we do a little bit of segmentation around, you can ask what office they're located in, mm-hmm. if they're in sales versus marketing versus engineering and, and having those little pieces of, of segmentation can really help you then identify where your problem areas are. And again, take away major themes and trends to then go build sort of scalable strategy. Okay. Okay. So that is that what you um is that what you would advise clients to do? So so they get their Q stack score and they see, you know, quality is down or speed is down, and you interpret that, you you look at the numbers, you see, okay, this building is getting lower speed, lower quality ratings consistently. Mm-hmm. You go to that building and then you what? Interview people? You ask. Yeah. yeah. 100%. You ask, you say, Hey, we heard you. And in, in our last round of whatever survey tool you use, right? We, we heard you and we're here to fix it. But can you tell us exactly what's going? We know there's a networking issue. We know there's a conference room, you know, room issue. Like, tell us. And you can create these really cool focus groups that then because people now trust you that this feedback is going somewhere, they're then going to give you more specific, more detailed and they're more excited about being part of the solution. Okay, this is perfect. And I think, um, you know, <laughs> good luck finding an IT department that doesn't send a survey. Um, I, I have yet to discover one. <laughs> I, I think it might be a good challenge. If you are an IT customer and you're listening to this podcast, like, let's let's hear it. I want to hear someone who's not sending surveys. Yep. Um, but sometimes you're just not getting the results you expect, you know, 5% return rates, 6% return rates, or, um, you know, you, you're reaching out for interviews and you're not getting responses. What, what do you, what do you coach your clients through to get better responses? So the biggest thing when we, we think about a survey and it is, that is a dirty word at QStack. So we, we call them pulses just because it's, you know, <laughs> people, people do hate a survey, right? And people yeah. get survey fatigue. That is a very real thing, especially in this remote world we live in. You're not in the office every day to kind of look around and kind of get a gut feel of how things are going. Everybody's behind their computer screen. Literally, mm-hmm. it could be hundreds of miles away. And so. The key to a successful survey in my eyes is one, that anonymous piece, right? You are not going to get good feedback if you are saying, hey, give me this feedback and then I can come find you and I know exactly why, you know, who you are and what you said and I can knock on your door and say, why did you say that about us? Um, because that's a big fear, right? Is that yes. if I do give you any type of criticism, then you're going to take more of my time by like coming to ask me specifically why, right? And I just like, here you go. Here's your answers. Like, go do something with it. So Step one, to me, anonymous is key. To me, number two, is keep it short. Mm -hmm. You know, people are on the fly, right? People are working. They they are going to answer an internal survey between the hours of nine to five. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they, uh, you know, they want to, they don't want to be taking their time answering surveys. They want to do their job and then get done and go hang out with their kids or their dog or whatever. So keeping it really brief making sure that those questions are really pointed into what you're trying to solve. And then finally, the third piece that I talk the most about to every customer and every readout is evangelize, evangelize, evangelize. If you know, it's that, that saying of, you know, if the tree falls in the woods and no one is there to hear it fall, did it make a sound, right? Like there are so many times where I'm dealing with IT teams and I'll get, you know, feedback around, Hey, the bot is giving a ton of bugs around this particular feature. And they'll say, Oh, we fixed that last week. Okay, did you, did you tell any tell anybody you fixed that? Because if you didn't tell them, they're just going to use it once, see there's a bug, and not want to use it again. 
But if you say, hey, sorry, we fixed that, all good, then they can go back and use it and go, oh, awesome, great. But we all get so siloed into our jobs and we're, you know, everybody's heads down that the minute something doesn't work and I find my workaround, I'm never going back to how I'm supposed to do it until you tell me to. And so that is a huge, huge thing that IT teams specifically kind of have a hard time with. Be your biggest champion. Cheerlead for yourself. Tell people all the exciting things. As, as an employee, it's all I want to hear about is what cool tools do I have access to? What are you working on for me to get better at my job, to do cooler things, to interact more efficiently? And it, it only makes IT look better. That is such good advice and so cool. Um, you know, as technologists, we're thinking about the next technological advancement, right? Right. We're, we're waiting for that next project where we're, you know, adding another server to improve performance. We're not thinking about, hey, you've got this awesome product or service that's already live. And guess what? We just brought it back up again. And guess what? It went down and we brought it back up again. And we keep reviving this thing over and over and over. <laughs> um, and we don't brag. We are not braggarts by no. nature. Um, especially because the, my wife says it constantly, thief, uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And so often we compare enterprise technology departments to things like Facebook and to companies like Apple. And, you know, they've got $72 trillion. There's a reason that they are so advanced technologically and provide such great service. You're not at the same budgetary level. That is above your pay grade. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And, you know, the other thing now in this, you know, again, this post-COVID world is, you know, remember, I remember when I was graduating and looking for jobs you know, you were going to these cool software companies and the perks were like, oh, they had beer pong tables and they had, you know, really cool like paintings on the walls and the office space had great snacks. And now that isn't the perk of working for a company. The perk is IT. Did I get the work from home setup that's going to be the most, you know, efficient, the best for me? Did I get a cool monitor, you know, a great headset? You know, these are the things that as I you know, when I look around for jobs that I'm focused on, and I think most of the workforce is, and there is a really competitive workforce out there. And, uh, you know, if, if you're not providing the right technology, then someone else will. And so really putting that attention towards IT uh, can only pay off long term for these companies. And I think IT is now starting to recognize that. And hence, experience has become the big word in, in the IT space. Yes. Someone else pointed out recently that the CIO became very, very more important to a company mm-hmm. than I, ever the before. The CIO isn't like sneaking around the corner anymore. They are front and center at any C-level meeting. Mm-hmm. They've got the keys to the water coolers. Yes, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. What a great example. And, um, you know, when that new hire first fires up that laptop for the first Zoom and they see their picture, if they don't come through clear and feel feel like they're being represented fairly to their teammates, you know, that's already egg on your face from an yeah. experience standpoint. So exactly. And I think it's easy for it to go above and beyond. When I first joined Verizon, Ben was actually the director of it there. So he had a, a little bit of an edge cause he knew me, but he had his team when they sent me my work from home package, they included this really cool note that said like, welcome to the Verizon team. It had, I'm a huge Swifty. That's an embarrassing fact about me. Um, and he like had put this blown up picture of Taylor Swift in the bar. I mean, they really like made me feel at a company like Verizon that is, you know, how many thousand employees I felt really special in that moment. I was like, God, I'm really excited to start my first day. And all it took was it just going a little bit out of their way to provide that excellent experience. I love it. That's fantastic. (laughs) You know, because I think employers do stock their, their, um, their, their candidates. It's pretty well known that 99% of HR uh, people will actually go look at your LinkedIn profile before you yep. get started. And um, I suppose that you just shared some some Taylor lyrics or something and they picked up on it. They picked up on it. And I, I, must, have, some, I must have had some picture somewhere and it was just above and beyond. It was just that little thing that made me go, oh, I'm, this is cool. I'm really excited to start my first day. Like I feel appreciated here. <laughs> That's great. That's so great. And it, it's, a, it's a testament, too, to the amount of data that we need in order to deliver these amazing experiences, right? You right. cannot just um, leverage the things that your customers are telling you. You also need to go out and seek it. 
You know, yeah. who who is this person? What do they actually care about? Are they are they working towards a bonus? Is it part of their quota they need to fill from a sales? Are they a huge Swifty fan? Like yeah. how how are you going to delight them today? Yep. I absolutely love that. So what are some of the big decisions that you think people are trying to gauge with QStack or with their metrics? Like what do you think people are really trying to change today? You know, I think one of the biggest things is going back to sort of that employee retention, right? Like this, this mm. is a really competitive workforce that we live in. You know, it's, mm -hmm. there are tons of really cool perks out there that exist. There's amazing companies doing amazing things. And, you know, again, you want to go to a company where you are going to feel like you are set up to be the most successful. And then you're going to stay at the company where you feel like people are listening and where you're, you're heard and you're not just another cog in the wheel, you know? So I think that is why IT, to your point about the CIO sort of being the most important person in the boardroom, that's why. Because the if, if you aren't meeting the needs, you know, work-wise of your employee base, there is a thousand other people they can jump ship to. And so to retain the best talent, you really need to have the best technology. And that starts with having sort of a really cohesive IT team that not as just, you know, not just the help desk, similar to customer success. I, again, the parallels um, are kind of canny that like they match up so well, but similar to customer success, I, I am a customer success manager. Yes, I am the one directly interacting with the customer, but I couldn't do my job without product, without mm -hmm. engineering, without customer marketing, without sales bringing me in customers to manage. And, and IT is the same way. The help desk is the front line. They're there interacting, but they are not going to be successful at their jobs if they don't have an awesome internal team, you know, internal tools team, a BI team, you know, whoever is operating in the back infrastructure. And so when IT sort of all pulls together in this really nice sort of cohesive bubble and all of the different engines are kind of, you know, op, you know, going in the same direction, it really makes a huge difference in how the business itself operates. Dang, dude, <laughs> that's a good point. You know, people don't, people <laughs> that, we, I don't, I just want to pause here because this is actually a huge point that when things are going smoothly, the employee experience is going smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> like, we forget that part. I, I also wonder how much an IT budget must have had to expand for end user computing devices. Yeah. Like we used, uh, no offense to my former employers, but we had terrible screens at work, you know, 24 inch, uh, 19 by six resolution or uh, ratio. Yeah. And now we have these huge high quality sprawling desktops and the webcams are all high def 1080p. And I've got some crazy lights in here to make me look good. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, I can't imagine how much they must have to pay per individual instead of it being like a thousand dollars for this laptop that it used to be. And, yeah. you know, maybe they'd get a docking station, a monitor for another couple hundred. Now it's blossomed to be like maybe three, four thousand dollars each just yeah. for employee basics. Yes. So in, in order for your employees to be, you know, it's that importance of sort of mental health and feeling like you've got, you know, the right ergonomic things to be able to stand, to sit, to, you know, have the monitors, so your eye level, et cetera. I mean, those, again, those are the perks, right? That yeah. is why you join a company is because you feel good about doing your job every day, not only good mentally, but physically. And uh, I think this, all, again, all is tying back to IT. And, and this is now sort of their whole world is sort of all these new inputs being put in. And to their credit, this is new. Like, you know, yeah. this is a, a shift and it's going to take some time, but, um, it's, let's it's get there. Good. It's getting there. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> We're on a mission. So when you look at like every service experience, like most IT shops, it's a very similar experience. Do you see one common thing that every service desk should change in, in their experience? That's like glaring, blaring. Everyone should pay attention to and focus and maybe reconsider how they're doing that one thing. Biggest thing where I see the uh, across the board, every customer is onboarding. The onboarding mm. experience is crucial because that sets the tone. And it, it's the little things like I just mentioned that, you know, I got my welcome box and it had that picture of Taylor Swift. That is above and beyond. But just having the right equipment, the day I start having the mm. right equipment that's loaded with the tools that I need to do my job on day one. And then on top of that, 
really having a really clear documented process of how to get in touch with IT. Because I'm drinking out of a fire hose day one. I'm not going to remember almost, you know, there are very few details are going to actually resonate with all the trainings and onboarding day HR, et cetera. But if I know, like, if I have a clear intranet or a one page document that they say, just don't lose this or here's access to this and whatever you need, you can reference this guide. That already is one less thing I have to like internally panic about of like, who do I slack to get help here? Like I have to ask a coworker and I'm kind of embarrassed because I should remember. And then I just end up Googling it and then I just never end up going to IT. And that sort of sets the tone of like, oh, I'm just going to avoid it. And so if you set the right expectation of we are here to make you successful, we are employee success. Mm. Here's how you get in touch with us. Here are the different channels. Here's how you escalate. You know, we know this is going to be a rough four weeks while you ramp in, but at least you, you at least have the path <laughs> to getting help. That's fantastic. That's well, you heard it here first. If your uh, if your strategy doesn't include a great onboarding experience, boy, should it ever. Yes. So, Maddie, where can people connect with you and learn more? Oh, absolutely. So, please do not hesitate to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Maddie Blumenthal. I love to chat about all things experience. Uh, or if you're interested, uh, come to QStack.com. You can get a hold of me there, and I uh, would love to chat with you about all things experience. Awesome. Thank you for joining us on Ticket Volume, Maddie. Thank you so much, Matt. We'll talk to you soon. And to our audience, thanks for listening to this episode. We've got a bunch more out there, so make sure to subscribe to receive an alert every time there's a new one. You can also submit a specific topic or guest like Maddie did. She said we should have Nate Brown on. We should totally have Nate Brown on. <laughs> but you can do so by visiting us on Ticket Volume's LinkedIn page or, by, or just by DMing me. And remember, if you share or leave feedback, the algorithms will reward us for your interaction. This podcast is brought to you by Invigate, the all-in-one IT service and asset management system that helps organizations with world-class IT support. If you're looking for a solution to build your help desk without implementations that are years long with lots of consternation, you'll love Invigate. In fact, IT teams from NASA, Toyota, and McDonald's use Invigate to manage requests, automate workflows, and centralize inventory data so they can focus on delivering better service. Thanks for hitting play. And I'll see you around the way. Mm -hmm.